1955, the king of Thailand traveled through the largest region of his kingdom. It was dried by drought. Crops were failing. The people there suffered from chronic poverty and malnutrition, even though they faithfully gathered every year to shoot homemade rockets into the sky to ask the weather god to release the monsoon upon the earth at the beginning of the rainy season. The situation was so dire that the king just start, started developing a plan to deal with it. In 1969, after 14 years of research and planning, the Royal Rainmaking Project was a go. A fleet of aircraft distributed dry ice flakes over the tops of the clouds. Uh, scientists argue over whether this actually works or not, but the government of Thailand says it started raining within 15 minutes of the flight. The project continues today, actually, in 2019, they conducted over 1,600 rainmaking operations throughout the kingdom. Sadly, as of 2020, Thailand is still experiencing drought, the worst in 40 years. So Psalm 72 is a song about a great kingdom and a great king. His reign is unlike any we've ever seen in all of human history, in any generation, in any place on planet Earth. In it, we see there's a perfect harmony between God and sovereign and citizens, and even nature is getting in on the participation. Who wouldn't want to live in this kingdom under this king? If you heard that read and you thought, I don't want to live there, man, go back and see what those verses said. We want to live in that kingdom under that king. Now, above verse one, you'll see the words of Solomon or a song of Solomon or a psalm of Solomon. Those are called the superscripts, and generally we take them at face value. And so we would think, well, that means it's by Solomon. And there are two Psalms in the Psalter that are, are written by Solomon, we think. But it's true that this Psalm could also mean for Solomon or concerning Solomon. There's just a little bit of confusion because this Psalm is the only one to have a postscript at the bottom. It's shown as verse 20 in your Bible, and it tells us the prayers of David, the son of Jesse are concluded. And so there's a little bit of a question. Is this a psalm of Solomon or is this a psalm of David? Well, it's possible that David wrote this song for his son. It's possible they worked on it together. And some scholars think that it may have been used during Solomon's coronation. Uh, Solomon was crowned king before David died, right? If you're familiar with the story, there was another brother who said, well, I'm going to be king, I think, even though everyone knew that the crown was supposed to go to Solomon. And so there was this intrigue and, you know, there's kind of like a group that wanted this other guy to be king. And so Solomon was crowned king while David was still alive. And so it's possible that this song was written by father and son or just by David or just by Solomon, but used in his court. Coronation. And it makes sense because as we hear this song, we, we're seeing an ideal king and an ideal kingdom. It would have been a great song to sing at the beginning, at the inauguration of a new uh, king. One commentator calls it a vision for government. And it's really quite a vision. It's the greatest example of human government that we could read. In fact, it's so great that we know that no kingdom has ever lived up to the words of Psalm 72. Even the two greatest kings of human history, David and Solomon, did not live up to the ideal of this song. And so let's take a look here. Let's begin in the first stanza, verse 1. God, give your justice to the king and your righteousness to the king's son. He will judge your people with righteousness and your afflicted ones with justice. May the mountains bring well-being to the people and the hills righteousness. May he vindicate the afflicted among the people, help the poor, and crush the oppressor. Rulers sometimes pick up nicknames, Ivan the Terrible, William the Conqueror, Cautious Cal. John Adams had a bunch of nicknames. A lot of people didn't like John Adams. One of his nicknames was His Rotundity. I liked that. <laughs> They would refer to him uh, as his rotundity in some publications. The king of Israel, whether it was David, Solomon, or anyone who came after them, they should always have the same nickname. They should always be whoever the righteous. That should always be after their name. Righteousness is the theme of this opening stanza, and it should define the nation of Israel and the man on the throne. 
Sometimes we hear the word righteousness. I know I do, and I just sort of knee-jerk think of, well, righteousness means not being bad, not doing bad things. But it really means more than that. The word implies living up to a standard. We talk about meeting standards, a standard of living, standard time, the gold standard. We understand what that means. And, and the king of Israel needed to conform to the standard given by God. That's what righteousness means. Living up to God's standard, doing things the way God does them, being in harmony with God's teachings, his statutes, his leading, his directions. And so here, if we imagine them singing this song at Solomon's coronation, he and the people are praying at his coronation, Lord, give me your justice and your righteousness, your standard, so that I can rule the people and judge fairly so that the whole kingdom can overflow with well-being. That's great. That's wonderful. That's what he's praying for. Today, how are government policies made? Often, not always, but often it's the result of polls, right? Skewed polls. Or they're shaped around selective data, statistics that reinforce certain ideas or perspectives. It's like, hey, we want to do this. Go do a study that will tell us we should do this. That kind of thing. But we see here that that's not the way policies are made in the ideal kingdom. When God is making the decision, when he's constructing a kingdom... It, the ideal kingdom is one where God's righteousness and his kindness and his grace and his truth are the standard. And that the king and everyone within the kingdom are being conformed and living life according to God's standard of righteousness. Now, the song has just begun. This is just the first stanza. But already we know that Solomon cannot live up to this ideal. He can't get there. No human king has ever been so righteous that the, the very mountains and hills work with him in blessing the people. That you have, okay, well, here's my you know, secretary of state, and here's my defense minister, and here's the mountains. They're also doing some <laughs> stuff here too. And so no king has ever been able to live up to this, and no king has ever been able to judge fairly in every single case. The ambition of this opening stanza, it's higher than any human government has ever been able to achieve. We get to the second stanza, verse 5. May they fear you while the sun endures and as long as the moon throughout all generations. May the king be like rain that falls on the cut grass, like spring showers that water the earth. May the righteous flourish in his days and well-being abound until the moon is no more. The king of Psalm 72 is a king who reigns. He reigns in nourishment and benefit and grace and provision upon his people. His, his administration over them is meant to be refreshment that causes growth. In reality, governments, rulers, leaders, uh, it, where do they get their power, their resources, the money they have, right? Right. No matter what kind of system you're in, whether a better system like, uh, you know, a constitutional republic or a worse system like, you know, a dictatorship, all the governments of the world, they have to get what they have by receiving or taking it from the people first and then distributing it back out, right? That's the whole idea of taxation. We're going to take everything that we need from the people and then we promise to give some of it back in this program, in this, you know, uh, you know, whatever, you know, with this benefit, we're going to build roads, we're going to do these things and we'll give back to you what we took from you. That's the idea. But we see something very much the opposite here, that you're, you're a person in this kingdom and the king is raining nourishment on you, raining grace on you, causing you to grow, giving you all that you need like water on the earth. And you know, this is one of the reasons why God originally, when he was establishing the nation of Israel, he first told Moses and then he spoke through Samuel and he said, hey, you really don't want a human king. And you get to the time of Samuel and the people said, we really want a human king because we wanna be like the nations of the world. And the Lord said, you really don't want a human king. You know why? Because he's going to have to tax you and, and he's going to have to take your land and he's going to take your horses and he's going to take your sons and daughters to serve him and he's going to take your labor. He's going to take all of these things from you. And if, if you let me be your king, I'm going to give you all sorts of things. I'm not going to take things from you. I'm just going to give you growth and satisfaction and blessing. He, he told Israel this again and again. They said, no, no, we want a king. 
But we see here in Psalm 72, God's heart for his people, for the kingdom that he wants to set up. His desire is that the king would nourish the people, help them to grow, the poor, the afflicted, those with less access than others. In this song, the blessing is for everybody, for all of them, for all the people, for every generation. It begs the question, of course, if this was God's intention, if this was his promise, if this was his desire and design, well, then why isn't there a son of David sitting on the throne in Israel right now? This stanza, verses five through seven, talks a big game, end of the moon, end of the sun, all of this. There will always be um, a, a, one of David's descendants on the throne. Well, where is he? If the moon shines at night tonight, why isn't there a Davidic king in Jerusalem? Well, most of you know why things are the way they are. Israel not only rejected God's way of doing things, they, they ended up rejecting God himself. After centuries of patience and mercy and trying to bring them back, God had to allow judgment to fall on the nation of Israel. And so that's why they are not a kingdom anymore. They went into exile and they were occupied then by Rome and, and there were no more kings. But even still... God has not given up on the nation of Israel, the physical descendants of Abraham. In fact, his promises, his intention, his affection for them still persist. His design for the kingdom is still going to happen one day. He still guarantees that one day a son of David will sit on the throne and Israel will experience the righteous blessings described in this song. So you have the nation of Israel back in the time of the Old Testament and they first said, God, we don't want to go your way. We want to go partially your way, but give us a human king. He says, okay, I'll condescend to that level. You shouldn't do this, but I will do it. And I'll even give you some really solid kings. David and Solomon. I mean, I, those are pretty much the two greatest kings that, that planet Earth has ever seen, right? David, a great warrior king. Solomon, a great building peacetime king. But even then they said, okay, and now, Lord, we're also going to keep going away from you. We're going to split into different kingdoms and we're going to start going after these other gods and we're going to desecrate your temple and, and we don't want to go your way at all anymore. And still the Lord says, okay, I will put all of my design and my plans for you on hold, but I'm not going to cancel them out. It's still going to happen one day. Now, Solomon was a great man. He started with a lot of promise. When God appeared to him in a dream at the beginning of his monarchy, he said, what do you want me to give you, Solomon? What does Solomon say? He says, oh, Lord, I need your wisdom. I need your insight and understanding so that I can lead this great people, your people. And you're like, wow, that's the kind of leader that we want to have. That's the kind of king you want to have on the throne. He had care and affection for his subjects. He thought of himself rightly with humility and an understanding that, Lord, you've put me in this position. And so I just want to be faithful to what you've called me to. But if you're a student of his story, you know that ultimately Solomon failed to live up to this stanza as well. Just after he died, right? The king is supposed to be a refreshing reign. But just after Solomon died, and people all gather to talk to Solomon's son. And they say, hey, we don't want to be rude, but man, your dad made our life hard. He made our life so difficult. He worked us to the bone. He put a harsh yoke of labor on us, they said. So can you just lighten that load a little bit? And so even Solomon wasn't a refreshing rain to his people. He was a heavy weight, a blistering wind. Verse eight says, may he rule from sea to sea and from the Euphrates to the ends of the earth. May desert tribes kneel before him and his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tarshish and the coast and islands bring tribute. The kings of Sheba and Seba offer gifts. Let all the kings bow in homage to him. All nations serve him. And so the chant here from this song is, you know, from sea to sea, may the, whole, may the kingdom cover the whole earth, right? We've been hearing a chant that is sort of reminiscent of this recently on the news, haven't we? From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Of course, the idea behind that little rhyme is we need to kill all the Jews, right? Genocide all of those people and, and just wipe them off the face of the earth. And then these other people can, can live where they were. That's the idea. But notice the difference between the way God designs things and the way man designs things. The way man designs things is, well, we'll just destroy those who disagree with us. We'll destroy the people who are living here, and we need to clear them out of the way. But we look at how God designs a kingdom. 
First of all, we see that he, his desire and his intention is to establish a righteous and wonderful kingdom that covers the whole earth. From, from sea to every, you know, every sea, all, every place on the earth, every island, every coast covered by his glorious kingdom. And you know, the Lord has the power to do it. And it's his right to do it because the earth is the Lord's and everything within, including your life and my life. It is his and it is his right to have it. But in his grace, God allows a great deal of freedom. In fact, even when he sets up his forever kingdom, which he's going to do one day, we discover in the prophetic books that he still allows nations to exist. It's kind of interesting, kind of even confusing. We look at some of these passages in sections like Micah or, or Zechariah or the Revelation, and we see talks about nations coming to Jerusalem. And I mean, we're not talking about uh, our time or the time of the Great Tribulation. We're talking about the kingdom and beyond where we're still identified by nations. And so the Lord, on some level, still allows people to have a national identity. And then even beyond that, he even allows them to have freedom to choose whether they're going to obey or disobey him. For example, in Zechariah, it talks about how he says, hey, and all the nations will need to come to Jerusalem to worship the Lord. But if they don't, well, then there's going to be consequences. He withholds the rain. Remember, he's the king who wants to rain growth and grace and nourishment on us. But he says, well, but if you don't want to come and interact with me, if you want to reject me, well, well, then your nation's not going to have rain. But what's amazing to that is God, even in his kingdom where he is ruling and reigning, he says, I'm still going to allow you to disobey me if you want to. That's mind boggling. A God who has absolute power right now, but especially in his kingdom, he absolutely has absolute power. He's ruling and reigning. And there he is on the throne. He says, hey, why don't you come and hang out with me in Jerusalem? And nations say, no, we don't want to. And he's like, okay. I'm going to allow you to make that choice. That's a God of grace, not of genocide. A God who invites, who welcomes, who makes a place for those who want in. In this kingdom, we see, though, that Israel will always remain distinct. Right? So God has a, a love and a desire for Gentiles to come and be grafted in, these other nations to come in and be a part. But Israel always remains distinct because they are his special people that he has a special plan and program for. Now, did Solomon live up to this verse or this stanza? No, he did expand the territory of Israel up to the Euphrates River, but he definitely didn't live up to this stanza. He made some friendships with other Gentile nations, but usually they didn't make him more righteous. In fact, it was his practice of marrying foreign wives often in these, to make these political alliances that ultimately drew Solomon's heart away from God. Uh, turned him into a person who says, oh, I don't even love the Lord anymore, and I'm going to worship the Baals and the Ashtoreths. And so he didn't live up to this stanza either. Verse 12, for he will rescue the poor who cry out and the afflicted who have no helper. He will have pity on the poor and helpless and save the lives of the poor. He will redeem them from oppression and violence, for their lives are precious in his sight. Ronald Reagan famously said that the nine most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help, right? It's sad. Why do we have government? We shouldn't have government. No, we should. God has established government, right, in order to restrain evil because human beings brought sin into the world, and that's a problem because now human beings do bad things to one another and want to take things that don't belong to them. And, and so the Lord says, okay, I'm going to establish government so that we can restrain wrongdoing. And so it's really sad, though, that often the people who God, you know, has philosophically installed to protect others become the ones who do the oppressing, become the ones who cause the affliction, who commit the violence, right, against their own people, against other people. We've seen time and time again in every place, in every generation, that governments hurt other, hurt people, right? Right? Uh, and it's a sad thing because the whole point is that government is supposed to protect the weak, help the afflicted, help the oppressed. The throne of Israel was always supposed to protect the weak, to help the poor. All government is supposed to do that because it is God's heart to help the weak. It is his delight to use his infinite strength to rescue, to save. That's who he is. He's the savior. He's the redeemer king. He uses his own wealth, 
his own resources, his own power to pay for your freedom, to pay for your future. God is doing that of his own free will, from his own stores of grace and power and provision. He says, I will pay for your freedom. I will pay for your future. I will do what is necessary so that you can have hope, so that you can have a tomorrow, so that you can have a life that's worth living. This God left his throne personally to come down and save you. As far as I know, the king of Thailand didn't fly any of those planes in 1969, let alone empty his treasuries to save his starving people. I don't know a lot about Thailand. I know that it doesn't seem to be one of the like, top 10, top five most affluent countries in the world. I do know that the current king of Thailand has a personal net worth of $40 billion dollars. Imagine him saying, I've emptied my vaults so that none of my people would go hungry, none of them, so that none of them would be impacted by the drought, so that all of them would have everything that they need and have hope for a future. Well, we would say, well, kings don't do that. That's right, they don't, not human kings. A few weeks ago, I was at a Christian graduation ceremony, and the main speaker talked about how important it is that you work to be a part of the kingdom of God. And he referenced the parable of the pearl of great price. And he said something to the effect of, do whatever you have to do to gain the kingdom of God. And I'll be honest, I was just so disappointed because no, no, you are the pearl of great price. You're not the merchant that finds the pearl. You are the pearl. God is the merchant who sold everything so that he could have you. That's how much he cares about you. What does this verse right there say in verse 14? Your life is precious in his sight. Your life matters. Your future matters. He gave everything, sparing not his own son in an effort to save you, in an effort to draw you to himself, to add you to his treasury. He has such plans for you and he spares no expense in accomplishing what he desires on your behalf. Now, if you you may say then, okay, well, if that's true, if God cares about me so much, why am I suffering? I don't feel protected. I don't feel provided for. I don't feel sheltered. Psalm 72 doesn't promise that you'll never suffer or struggle. What it tells us is that the great king is a savior and that he is one who shows pity and that he will redeem and that he is mindful of you and that you are his and he loves you and he will not forget to accomplish his plans for your life. Of course, Solomon didn't live up to this stanza either. No king could care this much. It's just impossible. There's not enough time. There's not enough resources. There's not enough willpower. There's not enough money. There isn't enough power vested in a single person for a human king to help every single suffering person in his kingdom. Verse 15, may he live long. May gold from Sheba be given to him. May prayer be offered for him continually. May he be blessed all day long. May there be plenty of grain in the land. May it wave on the tops of the mountains. May its crops be like Lebanon. May people flourish in the cities like the grass of the field. May his name endure forever as long as the sun shines. May his fame increase. May all nations be blessed by him and call him blessed. During the time when David and his sons were king, if the nation of Israel honored God and went his way and obeyed his statutes, he promised they would be materially blessed in miraculous ways. He said things like, your crops will never fail. You'll never have a miscarriage. You won't have diseases. I mean, you're going to plant one seed and, you know, 10 things are going to come out. He made these promises. That was the old covenant. He's like, if you do this, I will do that for you. It was, a, it was a sure promise, and he proved that it was true as he walked with them through the wilderness and helped them conquer the land of Canaan. That was his promise. And what's so sad is that the nation of Israel so quickly said, no, thank you. We don't believe. We don't remember. We don't acknowledge. And what happened is that it was the hearts of the kings that turned away from God first, and then the people followed. David was a man after God's own heart. He wasn't perfect, but... Then you have his son Solomon, even greater wealth, even greater knowledge, even greater greater ability, greater peace all around. And what happens at the end of his life? It says he did not love the Lord. And then you get to his son. And what little we know about his son is that he didn't care about the people at all, cared about himself. He cared about his own, you know, 
sort of human greatness. He cared about his own, uh, you know, ability to boss people around. And so the people turned away in the kingdom. And then after Solomon's son or during the time of Solomon's son, the kingdom split into two nations, Israel in the north, Judah in the south. And if you thought that was bad, it's downhill from there. (laughs) Israel in the north, they had all these kings, not a single one of them followed the Lord. And so they're taken into captivity, judged. And you think, oh man, that's terrible. And you know what's really bad is that Judah in the south watched what happened to Israel and they said, hmm, they just got taken by the Assyrian Empire and destroyed. You know what we should do? We should be more like the nation of Israel in the north. And the Lord's like, man, you saw what happened to your sister and now you're still doing this. And so it was a sad thing. Instead of flourishing, theirs was a history of fracturing. But their failure in this time of history was not God's failure. In fact, the Lord faithfully preserved a remnant no matter what was happening, both in the north and in the south. He extended centuries of mercy and help and deliverance and forgiveness again and again and again, even when the nation was unfaithful. The Lord is faithful when we are unfaithful. And when we reject God or disobey God and then suffer the consequences of that, that is not God's failure. It's simply what happens when we say no thank you to God and yes to sin, yes to the world, yes to the human way of doing things. Now, God has a great plan for your life. That plan is for growth and for progress as you walk with him. And ultimately, as we sort of zoom back, we see in the Bible that his plan is for the whole world to be blessed by his grace and his truth and his righteousness. There in verse 17, we hear echoed again the promise that he made all the way back in the time of Abraham when he started this whole nation of Israel thing. He told Abraham, hey, through you and through the work that I'm gonna do through your family, all the nations of the world are gonna be blessed. And here it is in the coronation song for Solomon, it's echoed again because that's God's desire to bless this world, to reconcile this world, to cover this world in his grace and his righteousness. And more than just his desire, more than just a hope that he has, that is God's work. It is a work he is still accomplishing in the grand scheme of things and accomplishing in your life and through your life if you're a Christian. He says, I'm going to complete this work and you get to participate in it if you want. Verse 18, the song comes to a close. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does wonders. Blessed be his glorious name forever. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Amen and amen. Solomon was a great man, arguably by some metrics, the greatest king to ever live, the wisest to ever live, the wealthiest to ever live. But as the song comes to a close here, he and David and everyone else at that coronation ceremony They take this moment to acknowledge that it is God alone who does wonders. Not the great man, not the smartest person. It is God alone. It wasn't the throne of Israel that gave wealth or power or greatness. It was the God of Israel who established the throne. And so as this coronation ceremony ends, everyone there hearing the song, singing the song, they recognize that we need someone greater than Solomon. Someone whose name would be above every other name. Someone whose glory would fill the whole earth. Someone who actually could live up to the ideal. They had great hopes for Solomon, but singing this song, they knew no human could actually live up to this. And Solomon absolutely didn't. Not a single stanza. But at the end there, they say, amen and amen. Two of them, let it be true. Yes, let it happen. They're hoping, they're waiting, they're trusting God. And you know what? It was a long wait with a lot of letdowns over the centuries. And if you were, uh, you know, a son of Abraham living in the first century, you're looking around you saying, we have no king. We have no kingdom. We're occupied by Rome. What happened? What went wrong? And it seemed like there was no hope for your future? How could you ever throw off Rome? How could you ever lay hold of the ideal that Psalm 72 sang about and that you sang about in synagogue week after week? And then something amazing happened. And we read about it in passages like Matthew 12. You know what happens? A descendant of David showed up and he said, look, something greater than Solomon is here. It's me, Jesus Christ. I'm greater than Solomon. 
And we think, well, that's kind of, you're saying you're smarter than Solomon? He's like, no, no, no. I'm the son of David who can actually live up to Psalm 72. And then what did he tell the leaders of Israel? He says, the kingdom's at hand. I put it on the table. Do you want it? I'm ready. I'm the, I'm the son of David. I'm greater than Solomon. I'm offering you the kingdom. We've been waiting hundreds and hundreds of years. Do you want it? You can have it. That perfect, wondrous, ideal kingdom from Psalm 72. We can establish it right here, right now. And what was the response? The leaders of Israel rejected the king. The Romans nailed him to a cross. They shouted, we have no king but Caesar. Wow. And the Gentiles said, oh yeah, surely he was the son of God. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> Nailing him to a cross, right? And so the world said, no thank you to the Lord yet again. And so the ideal kingdom was put on hold once more. But it's still coming. It is a real kingdom and it will be established. It's not allegorical. And we don't build it ourselves. There is a, a vein of Christian teaching that says, well, Christians have to build the kingdom and when it's ready, the king will come. The whole point is the two greatest kings of all human history, but certainly Israel's history, couldn't come close. They couldn't live up to one stanza. We cannot build this kingdom and then have it good enough, white glove ready for the king to come. No, not at all. We're not gonna build it. We're waiting for it to be established. We're waiting for that moment that is recorded, announced in Revelation chapter 11, when it finally happens, when the king comes again for the last time. And what is announced? The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. It's coming. It's happening. We know who the king is. We know what his plan is. He has announced it. And now we get to be a part of making straight the paths for him so that others can be included into that kingdom so they can have a place in it for when he establishes it forever and ever. When the whole earth will be filled with his righteousness and his graciousness and the perfect glory of God. Verse 20 ends the song, the prayers of David, son of Jesse are concluded. The prayers were concluded. The plan continues. God's plan for this world, God's plan for your life is continuing. Do you know what God is doing right now? He's doing things for you. He has you on his mind, you on his heart. He has a hope for you, a future for you, a plan for you. And he says, I would really like you to participate with me in it. And we get a chance to say, okay, I'm not going to say, no, Lord, I want a king like the rest of the nations have, or no, Lord, I want to go into this kingdom over here. We get a chance to say, okay, Lord, I will crown you king in my heart. I know you're coming one day to rule and reign bodily, visibly in Jerusalem in a kingdom that will never end. But today, right now, your kingdom come, your will be done as earth as it is in heaven in my life. I put you on the throne. I crown you king because I recognize that you are who you say you are that Jesus, you are the root and the offspring of David, that you are greater than Solomon, that you are the Messiah, and I am a citizen of your kingdom. And when the world offers me these other things, these other distractions, these other ways of living, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to do it. I trust you. I believe you. I want to serve you. You know, we have a vision for government. Not the way we think government should run. No, the vision is the vision shown to us in Bible prophecy. The future vision, like the Revelation, the end of Ezekiel, book of Isaiah. We know who the king is who lives up to every stanza of Psalm 72, every single one. The one who can accomplish this ideal. And so we crown him in our hearts and invite him to be our king. And remember that he is the one who rains his living water on us so that we can have life more abundantly as he pours out his grace and his power and his righteousness forever and ever. Amen.